Tonight on Local Light, Dr. Donna Beagle brings her first-hand experience and years of study on poverty to the show. After growing up in a fruit-picking family with little to no education, Donna forged a life that few could have expected. She now educates and inspires both the poor and well-off alike. That's all tonight on Localite. Donna, it's a pleasure to have you back. Thank you. Thank you for working us into your busy schedule. My honor. Yeah, well, I want to start uh, for folks that maybe aren't familiar with you and don't know your story and all that you've, uh, you've been through and all that you've become. Take me back. When you started life, it was not in an easy place. Well, I was born to a cotton picking family. Um, my grandparents and my parents both survived picking cotton. My family survived as I was growing up doing migrant labor work. So I was born in Phoenix, Arizona, and we would leave Phoenix. We would pick cherries, strawberries, oranges, grapefruits, land in Oregon area, pine cones, mar uh, mushrooms, bark, um, the kinds of jobs that you're going to get when you're not literate. Most of my family members are not literate. So they, the, the, the amount of money they're able to earn um, is not enough to survive usually beyond a day. So wow. I grew up in that kind of context where everything was about how are we going to make it through the day? Where are we going to get food for today? How are we going to sleep tonight? Um, and I have five brothers. I'm actually the only family member who's not been incarcerated. Um, and I talk a lot about that in my trainings because the United States was just... Uh, given the award of having more people in cages than any other country, including China. China's now second to us. And if you start looking at who's in prison, you see 80% can't read at eighth grade level, 44% are struggling with mental health issues. And so I, I do a lot of work to illuminate, you know, a lot of the issues that are, we're struggling with are poverty. And so I... Um, I grew up in a world where uh, nobody moved up in a job, um, where education wasn't for people like us. All through school, I didn't know the words my teachers would use. They would say things, and I'd say, well, what is that word? And they would tell me to go look at it in a dictionary. But so you didn't I, know how to do that even. Well, I, even when I got to the dictionary, there would be five more words that nobody around me used. And so often that was equated to my IQ. And people would say, well, she's not very bright. She doesn't know these words. Or she's not very bright. She hasn't had middle class experiences. And, and I find a lot of our children in the nation are placed in special ed. And the criteria is, do they know middle class stuff? So I try to teach people that, you know, what they know now isn't all they can know. Right. It's just what they've been exposed to in their context. Um, but I... Um, Met my uh, ex-husband at 12, um, married at 15, and started living life very much like I'd grown up. I had my honeymoon in a cherry field in Wenatchee, Washington, and traveled to California to pick cherries. And I had children at 17, 18, 19, 22, 24, 25. How um, many kids did you have? I've had eight pregnancy. I have three living children, and that's another big issue is I come from a world of no health care, where if you get really sick, you go to the emergency room, hope they give you some samples, because <laughs> you can't buy the prescriptions. So, you know, we shared antibiotics. We say, my mom would say, well, I had this last year here. It might help you. And we share glasses that were gotten from a, a clothing closet in a church basement. Which were the wrong not even uh, the right prescription and all <laughs> yeah. of that yeah so I actually heard a governor say the other day during the health care debates that we have health care in America we have emergency rooms and I was like wow I bet you've never been to one because when you go to emergency room the emergency room physician tells you what go see your doctor yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so I, I I was living that life I had dropped out of ninth grade uh, my teacher said to me when I dropped out, don't drop out because you're going to want a job. And one of the concepts I teach is that meanings are in people. So what does a job mean to a teacher? What does a job mean to a migrant labor worker? Um, you know, I never saw people treated with respect. I saw people work hard my whole life and still make choices between rent and food, still get evicted, still go hungry. And so I looked at the teacher and said, I don't want a job. Yeah. 
you know, and a lot of times that's perceived as people are lazy, but the truth is in their experience, those jobs that they get are not jobs you would want. All they do is take you away from your family. Right. And I know when we talked before, you had talked to me about the system. We, we, you know, we all know the system is not working correctly. And you had talked about people who get jobs but are under governmental assistance, then lose their governmental assistance. And so it's kind of this vicious circle. So how did you kind of break that and start being able to move, move forward and, and start achieving these things that you have? Well, my marriage ended um, in 1986, and my ex-husband, Jerry, went, uh, he moved into a car that we had bought at an auction for $25 near Sumner, Washington, and I went to apply for welfare. I had a six-year-old and a two-year-old, and they said, well, we'll help you um, with $408 a month. Um, my rent was three ninety-five. dollars and they said, but before we help you, we have to have you fill out these papers so we can get your ex-husband. And I was like, wow, you know, he dropped out of seventh grade, came from generational migrant labor family, never had a pillow to lay his head on, couldn't even read and write. I mean, the jobs he got, I was filling out the applications because I had six months of the ninth grade, but the jobs he was able to get as being illiterate never paid enough. So. Um, one of the things I teach is we need to really focus on men in poverty. We don't even talk about men in poverty. We sort of have this idea that their maleness is going to get them out. Um, but my marriage ended and I was making choices monthly. Do I pay the rent? Do I, do I pay the utilities? I was um, selling food stamps to pay the utilities and then running to the food banks and going to clothing closets um, to get clothes. and just this I, the whole little hamster on the wheel yeah. scene and eventually my lights got shut out and I went to a community action agency and community action agencies came out of the war on poverty Johnson's war on poverty that most people don't know we had and if they do know they think we were losing mm. but the truth is um, when Johnson said we're gonna fight the poverty and not the people who live in it he put resources and people into housing issues job skills, education, to some of those structural core root causes of poverty. And poverty was reduced 23%. Those resources were taken away from the war on poverty and put into the war in Vietnam. And at that point in our history, you see poverty rates begin to climb again. Um, so I actually stumbled into community action. And one of the things community action does is sort of a both and approach. It's like, yes, you need your lights turned on, but you also need some opportunity. Mm -hmm. And they told me about a program that was just starting up. It was a pilot program. And, you know, at that point in my life, I said ain't every other word. I didn't know when to say seen or saw or how do you know when to say gone or went? I didn't even know I wasn't speaking correctly. I had attitude. I had the smart mouth. I believed people didn't care. And and I thought, you know, she, when they said to me, why don't you check out this program? I was like, I don't want to do your pro. You go do the program. But that's because that's what you were taught. Yeah. That's all you knew, that's right? That's all I knew. Yeah. And so I went to that program, not because I'm better than everybody else or smarter than everybody else or more motivated or more determined, but I went because I didn't know what else to do. Okay. And when I got there, they said, if you do this program, you become eligible for housing. That was my carrot. And so my thinking at the time was, I'll do the program, but you're not going to change me. Because one of the first things they said to me was, we're going to help you change. Well, if you think about that, what does that leave hanging in the air? Um, I've already had know. all these messages that I'm not okay. And so I'm thinking, you know, I have to be all okay. I'm all I have. And so I entered that program just thinking I was going to get through it and get the certificate. But within that program, they did a lot of the things that I teach today. They really took the time to unravel the shame that poverty teaches. Those messages that you're not smart, you're not somebody. And they shared their life stories. Yeah. I had never heard a middle class person's life story, wow. ever. Well, when we come back from the break, I want to talk to you about a little more of, you know, where you are at and how you got pulled out of that. But um, also just put a better uh, understanding for folks on, on what poverty is, because so, so many of us that don't live in it don't really understand it. So we'll be right back, stick with us. After the break. When I was listening to their stories, I was thinking, wow, you lived in one house your whole childhood? You went to one school? 
You've never been hungry? 